Hey everyone, welcome to week three of Computer Science 225. This week is a continuation of last week in a way, in that we'll be continuing to talk about things related to managing files and directories on the command line. We'll talk about a few specific things. For instance, we'll start off by talking about using wildcards on the command line, which is a way in which you can refer to multiple files or directories in one command without having to type them all out sort of one by one. We'll also talk about how you find the disk usage of files and directories, which is going to be useful if, for example, your um, drive is starting to fill up and you need to find the biggest files or directories so that you can remove them or back them up or something else to save space. We'll look at how you use links on the command line, which is uh, a way that you can sort of create a link to a file or a directory someplace else, which is sometimes helpful, something that will come up, so it's good to know. We'll also talk about creating archives on the command line. Archives are like .zip files, which is probably the one you're most familiar with. A zip file, as you probably know, can contain uh, multiple files and directories all sort of wrapped up into one file. It's called an archive. Um, you can use .zip files on the Unix command line, and we'll look at how you do that. But there's also sort of a more common way of doing that in Unix, which is to create a .tar file. Tar files are sort of the more Unix-focused uh, way of making archives. So we'll look at the tar command and how you can use it to make an archive, extract files out of an archive, list the files that are in an archive, and so on. Next, we'll talk about how you can download a file from the internet directly onto the CPSC server, which is something that's sometimes helpful to do. Another really helpful thing we'll look at is how you can uh, take files and share them back and forth between your own local computer, your laptop or desktop, and the CPSC server. How do you transfer files between machines like that? We'll, uh, you'll find that you'll need to do this from time to time, like if you're taking a class in which you need to write some code on the CPSC server, you might need to transfer it to your own local computer so that you can turn it in, or maybe you just want to make a backup of it. Likewise, you might want to take a file that's on your laptop or desktop and put it onto the CPSC server. So we'll learn how to do that as well. So let's open up a terminal and we can start talking about the first topic that we have, which is using wildcards. Okay, so for this, let's cd into this test directory I have, which contains a number of files inside of it. So we have assignment1.py and program1 through 5.py. Now, the idea behind our first topic, wildcards, is that Sometimes you want to do some action on lots of files at once. And so, for instance, let's say I want to make a copy of all of these files in, let's say, a backup directory just so that if I change one of them, I might be able to go back and look at the previous version. So I'll make a directory called backup with the mkdir command. And now, let's say I want to make a copy of all of these Python program files and put it into backup. As we learned last time, one way I can do that is I can copy assignment1.py and program1.py and program2.py and program3.py, etc., all into the backup directory. So if I was to finish typing that out, it would be a little bit of typing, um, copying assignment1, program1, 2, 3, 4, and 5.py all into our backup directory. And then you can see that now inside of backup, we have all of these Python files sort of copied in. So that was a bit of typing to list all of these files out. Using tab completion made it a little bit easier, but it still is not as, uh, not as easy as it could be. So let me um, remove everything from the backup directory. Um, oops, let me uh, <laughs> cd into the backup directory. And then rm, again, if I want to remove all of these things, I might have to type them all out one by one. But as we'll see in just a second here, there's a better way to refer to multiple files sort of all at once. So now I've deleted them out of the backup directory. I can go back up to the test directory and see that I just have the files here, but the backup directory is empty. So wildcards allow you to reference multiple files all at once. So if I wanted to copy all of these Python programs into the backup directory, the sort of more efficient way of doing it is to say I want to copy star.py into backup. Now what the star, the asterisk, uh, symbol means is it's a wildcard. It can match to any string of text at all. So if I say copy star.py, it essentially means copy everything that has some text, whatever 
um, letters or numbers or characters at all, and ending in .py. So in effect, what it's going to do is it's going to find every file that ends in .py, and it's going to match it to this wildcard here. So if I run this command like this, then now suddenly inside of backup, there should be a copy of all of the .py files copied in. That is a wildcard, this, dot, this uh, star or asterisk symbol. So if I want it to go into the backup directory, and then let's say I want it to delete all of the things in here, I could again say rm star dot py. That will remove all of the things ending in dot py. Let me go back up to the test directory, and we can try a different thing. Now what I can do is I can say um, copy star dot py into backup again. That'll put all of the things back in there, so I can cd into backup. Now we have all of the .py files again copied into backup, just like we did last time. Now if I want it to, um, let's say, uh, remove all of these files. Let's say I just want to remove all of the files in a directory all together, and I don't care anything about what they're named. I don't care if they end in .py. I just want to remove, remove everything. You can say rm star rm star will remove every file that's in this directory. Now, of course, this is a very uh, dangerous thing that you have to be careful with because it will remove literally every file that's inside of this directory. And so if you're not totally sure you want to do that, you shouldn't really use the rm star command. Um, but the idea is that star matches everything. So if I do rm star here, then everything would be gone. Even if there were files that didn't end in .py, if there were text files or .java files or anything, they would be gotten rid of with this rm star command. Let's go back up um, and look at something else. Um, we have, as you can see, a few different files in here that end in .py. If we reference star.py, like we said, it matches anything at all that ends in .py. We can be a little bit more specific, though, based off of the file names when we're using wildcards. So for instance, if I want it to copy just the ones that are called program such and such into backup, I could do that as well. I can say copy everything that starts with program into backup. And now the asterisk, the wildcard, is at the end. So in this case, when it's at the beginning, it matches everything ending in .py. In this case, the asterisk is at the um, end of the text. And so what this matches is it matches everything that starts with the word program. So we can say copy program followed by any text at all. That will match program1.py, program2.py, program3.py, etc. copying all of those into backup. But now it's not going to match assignment1.py because that doesn't start with the word program. So now inside of backup, we have just program12345.py. All right, let's uh, remove um, everything in backup again so we can try another example. Um, this time I can use this, sim uh, this wildcard, remove inside of backup everything starting with any text at all and ending with py. This will also remove all of them. So you can put a wildcard um, inside of uh, something with a directory like this as well. This says remove everything in the backup directory that ends in .py, essentially. There's another wildcard symbol. The splat, the star, the asterisk, matches any text whatsoever, um, no matter how long it is. There's another symbol as well, which is the question mark symbol. And what the question ma mark does is it matches exactly one letter, exactly one character, or exactly one symbol. So for instance, if I want to remove, uh, or rather copy all of these files, the program 12345.py, into backup, Another way I could do that is I can say copy program question mark dot pi into backup. Now the question mark matches exactly one letter. So it'll match program 1.py, 2.py, 3.py, 4.py, 5.py, um, but it won't match anything else. It won't match anything that has more than one symbol between the program and the dot pi. So if I make that copy, all of these will be put into backup. Let's just say I also had program 10.py inside of here. If I, let's say, ls um, program question mark.py, this will just list those files. Um, now this won't capture program 10.py because it doesn't have exactly one symbol, exactly one character between the word program and the word pi. 
So the asterisk marks, uh, matches any text whatsoever, and the question mark matches exactly one symbol, one character. So the question mark is, uh, matches one character, like I said. I don't think that's as commonly uh, used as the asterisk one. Let me remove everything from backup again. This time I did it just by saying rm backup slash star. Remove everything from backup. We don't care about the file name at all. No matter what letters it has inside of it, it'll get removed. Um, let's make another program. Let's make if, let's say, in addition to uh, assignment one, let's make a file called assignment2.java, for instance. Now, the thing with the asterisk is that it fills in for any number of characters. So if I want it to list all of the Java files, I can say ls star Java. This will list everything ending in the word Java, which will be just our one file, assignment2.java. I can list everything starting with even just an A. That will list all of the files and directories that begin with A, which in this case is just assignment1.java and assignment2.java. I can list everything that has a 1 in it by using two asterisks. This is something you can do as well. This will match any text whatsoever, followed by a 1, followed by any text whatsoever. So this should match everything that has a 1 in it, which in this case is assignment1.py, program1.py, and program10.py, because that also has a 1 in it. So basically, you can use the wildcards to form the pattern for which the files you want to affect with your commands should be matched. It's a really um, powerful and also sort of widely used thing if you want to do something on multiple files without having to test them all out. If you can find some pattern that they all sort of fit, like all of the .java files or all of the files that begin with A or something like that, then you can use wildcards to do it in a more effective way. All right, now let's go back to the um, home directory and clear the screen so we can talk about our next topic which is seeing how much space files and directories take up. So last time we looked at the ls command, and if we pass it the dash l flag, it will give us a long listing, which includes the space taken up by the files and directories. And like I said, if we pass the h option as well, it'll give it to us in a more human readable format. Now the thing about um, ls is that when it lists these um, uh, file sizes, it only includes this thing itself, like how much space does this directory or this file take up just by itself. It doesn't include all of the things inside of those directories. So all of the directories that you'll see here always take up 4.0k, which isn't actually that helpful. That's sort of like the minimum size that a directory takes up just to store in the file system. Uh, the, the, the fact that there's a directory here, what the directory's name is, what its permissions are, what its owner is, and stuff like that, sort of the metadata about the directory. So these will just always list 4.0k, okay, which is not actually that helpful. There's another command that we can use to get like the actual size of a directory, including its actual contents, which is the thing that you would really want to know. And that is the du command, which stands for disk usage. If you do disk usage just by itself, it will give you the disk usage of all of your directories, including all of the hidden directories, which as you can see in this case is a lot, um, mostly for my Vim setup. Um, but when you get down here, you can see past the hidden directories that we have Project 1 uh, takes 68, um, 68 what, you might ask. Um, uh, the test directory that we were just inside of takes 8. Um, and then the dot directory, which is the directory that we're in currently, takes uh, what 10,060. So by default, these, just like um, ls, shows in bytes. Um, you can also pass the du-h flag, which just like for ls, stands for human readable. And then it will give you them in human readable format. So we can see the test directory we were just in takes up 8 kilobytes. The um, backup directory of that takes 4 kilobytes. Um, that's because all of the files uh, in there, those .py and .java files, were basically just empty, so they don't actually take up any space. So let's cd into this project1 directory that I have, which actually has sort of more interesting things inside of it because the files are actually filled in. So inside of this directory, I have some Java files, um, a couple of shell scripts, and then a test directory. Um, and so uh, what we can do inside of here is do the du-h 
um, command, in which case it will show us just the directory that we're in right now. So if we did it in our home directory, it shows everything, including all of these hidden directories, which, like I said last time, usually we don't even care about. But in this case, du-h lists the home directory as being 68 kilobytes and the test directory inside of this as being 28 kilobytes. If we cd into tests, we'll see that there's a number of um, files inside of it and there are various um, number of bytes. And so all together, along with the 4K to store the test directory itself, that comes out to 28 kilobytes. Then up here, um, if we do the ls-l again, we'll see that these files, if we were to take the time to add them up, plus adding in the uh, 28 kilobytes of the test directory, it would be 68 kilobytes. So du will show us how much disk space is taken up by uh, the files and directories that are actually inside of directories. So if you want to see how big a directory is, how much space it's actually taking up, you use the du command, usually with the dash h option, and then give it uh, either no argument at all if you want the current directory or the name of a directory if you want to see how much space that directory is taking up, including all of its contents. So like I said previously, the place that this will sort of most come into play is if you um, are running out of space on your drive. You have a gigabyte to use on the CPSC server, which is probably going to be enough. But if you do, for whatever reason, run out of that space, the du command with the dash h flag will tell you how much space all of your directories are taking up so that if you do need to save space, you'll be able to. All right, let's clear the screen again and go back to our home directory so that we can talk about symbolic links, which is our next topic. So a symbolic link is a shortcut to a file or a directory, essentially. It's sort of like a copy to it, except that it doesn't actually store all of the contents to it. Instead, it's just sort of a um, stores sort of where the real file or the real directory is at. It's the same concept as a pointer or a reference in programming, if you've gotten to the point where you're using pointers and references and talking about them in your computer science classes. It's also sort of like a web link. If you write down a web link somewhere, you didn't actually copy the web page or copy the contents of what's stored in the web page. Instead, you just sort of wrote down the directions for going to find out where the contents are. So for instance, I can make a link with this ln command. We um, actually have two different types of links in Unix systems. There's hard links and soft links. Soft links or symbolic links are by far the more common um, variety. So to make a soft link, you do the dash s um, uh, option to ln. Then we have, um, you give it the name of the file or directory you want to link to. And then you give the name of the link that you want to create. So I can, for instance, make a link like this. This will create a um, copy, sort of like a copy um, of program.py as p.py. And so what p.py is, is it's a symbolic link. The uh, ls command by default colors these in sort of a teal color, which tells you that this is not actually a real file. It's just a link to a file. There's another command that we can use to verify this, which is the file command. File is a sort of helpful command to know in general. And what it does is it tells you what sort of um, uh, file or directory it is that you give it. So if we do file on grading, it will tell us this is a directory. If we do file on program.py, it should tell us it's a Python script. If we do file on p.py, it will tell us it's a symbolic link to program.py. So this tells us this is not actually a real file. It's just a link to something else. The sort of interesting thing about it is that we can access p.py, and it will um, work just the same as if we access program.py. So if I cat it, which is to print it to the screen, it should give us the actual um, text of this, which is just a very, very short, simple pro Python program. Um, there's not much point um, of making a symbolic link in the same directory like this. Um, 
because you might as well really just write program.py. So I can remove this symbolic link by removing p.py. That won't remove program.py, luckily. It just removes the link to it. The place that I find um, symbolic links sort of helpful is if you have a uh, file that is like nested down in some directory somewhere, and you want to be able to sort of access it a little bit more easily, then um, you can make a symbolic link uh, to a file that's basically stored somewhere else, for instance. As a sort of real example I have of making symbolic links, I will SSH, uh, or rather I'll get out of the CPSC server and go into another machine, which is my website that you all are um, probably watching this video on. If I SSH into my website, you'll see that in my home directory, I actually have two symbolic links for the two classes that I'm currently teaching. I uh, keep all of the data in my website within this www folder. And so then we could go into www and then into class. And then here's where I have all of the um, files and folders and stuff for the different classes I teach. So then I could CD into CPSC 225 for instance, and then look at the stuff that I have within that directory, which includes the notes pages. Um, these are all the HTML pages for the different things that uh, you're seeing on this website right now, probably. But it's sort of annoying to have to CD into www and then class and then CPSC 225 because I use those files and directories a lot. Um, Instead, I've made these symbolic links. So 225 is a symbolic link to www class CPSC 225. So that if I want to go there, I can just CD into 225, and then I have all of those things sort of more easily accessible at hand like that. So that's an example of how I really use um, the uh, symbolic links in my day-to-day -day life. Let me get back into cpsc.umw.edu so we can continue on talking about other things. Um, but I wanted to show you that because that's just sort of a real life example of how to do that. Another reason you can use symbolic links is if you um, have a file that has to be in a particular location for some reason, like a program depends on it being there, but you also want to have it somewhere else so that it's more easily accessible for you, then you can uh, use a symbolic link for that as well. Um, for instance, I have in this config directory, I have things like my bash setup and my vim setup, which we'll talk about in coming weeks. But I also have symbolic links to them here because vim and bash need them to be directly in your home directory. But I actually want them to be in my config directory so that I can more easily copy that around. So inside of here, I have my file called .vimrc is actually a symbolic link to config slash vimrc. So we'll see more um, probably examples of using symbolic links in the coming weeks, but uh, I want to talk about it here because it sort of fits on creating files and, and directories and so on. All right, our next topic is on creating archives. So in the Unix system, the common archive file format isn't a .zip file, but rather a .tar file. So we can make a tar file and also extract a tar file using the tar command. Tar stands for tape archive. This name comes from back in the day when most backups were done by putting them onto sort of magnetic tapes. Um, that's uh, sort of an antiquated um, idea now, but the name tape archive or tar for short sure still persists. So the way that we can do this is we can say we want to um, create an archive by passing the dash C flag. Then we pass the dash F flag either separately like that or like together like that, like we talked about last week. Then you give the name of the archive you want to create. So if I want to create, um, like let's say project one backup like that, then I can um, specify that as my output file. So we want to create a archive and the dash F flag stands for uh, the file name of the archive you're going to create, which in this case I can call it whatever I want, project1-backup.tar. Then you pass the name of the files or directories that you want to be included in that. So oftentimes this is just the name of a single directory. If you want to make a directory into an archive, then you would pass it like that. Just for fun, I'll also throw in program1.py into the archive. When we do that, we create a new file, which is project1 
dash backup.tar, which if we check with the file command, it will verify for us that this is a tar archive. Now, um, if we want to list the files that are in this archive, we can do that with the dash t flag. So dash c is for creating archives, dash t is for listing archives. We'll also always pretty much give it the dash f option as well to specify what file we want to make the list listing of in this case. And so then what tar will do is if you give it dash t is it'll list whatever files are inside of here. So we have project one with all the stuff in it, and then we also have program one.py. The other um, main thing you'll do with archives is unarchive them or extract them. So let me remove um, project one uh, directory with the rm-r, which we talked about last week, that removes the entire directory and all of its contents. If I do that, then project one should be gone. I'll also remove program one.py with the rm command. Now those things are gone. They only exist inside of this archive. If I then want to unarchive it, I can use the tar command with the dash x option that unarchives it. And then, like usual, we have to pass dash f followed by the name of the tar file. If we do that, then those things are pulled out of the archive. Now program.py is back, and project one uh, is back as well with all of the stuff inside of it. Extracting the archive doesn't remove the archive, so project one backup.tar is still here as well. So, two more. This is basically all you need to know to use tar dash c to create, dash t to list, and then dash x to extract. But there's two more flags that are worth talking about. One is the dash z flag, which actually compresses the tar archive. So by default, a tar archive just like concatenates all the files together inside of one big file, essentially. It doesn't actually make it smaller like a .zip file does. So if we were to um, do a long listing with the dash l and dash h option to give it in human readable format, we'll see that this project one dash backup dot tar takes up 30 kilobytes. Um, that's basically the size of program one dot uh, program.py plus all the stuff in project one, just add it together, all the files and directories. Um, it doesn't actually make it any smaller. So I'll remove that now. Remove uh, project one dash backup dot tar. Now let's try it again. But this time, in addition to the C flag for create, we'll also pass the Z flag for um, compression and then give it the name. I'll give it just the same name as it had last time project one dash backup dot tar, except now by convention we add dot gz at the end to signify that this is actually also compressed. Um, gzip is a sort of separate compression program that you can run actually independently of tar, but by, by sort of convention if you give it the dash z flag, you'll name it instead of dot tar for just a tape archive, you'll name it dot tar dot gz. It's a tape archive that's also been gzipped or compressed. Um, it's kind of weird in Windows anyway to have two extensions like this in a file, but it's not that uncommon in Unix. Um, this is sort of project one uh, dash backup dot tar dot gz. So it's a tar file that's also been compressed. Then like uh, before, we give it all of the names of the files and or directories that we want included in the archive. And now it will create Again, this project one dash backup dot tar. But if we use the ls dash lh to see the size of it, instead of being 30k like it was before, now it's only 4.3k, so it's been compressed. All right, let's remove it one more time so we can talk about the uh, other flag that I'll talk about that's really common, which is the v flag. By the way, I want to emphasize this again. You can use the up and down arrows to go back and forth between commands. Don't forget that you can do that when you're working on the command line. So rather than type this whole thing out again, I'm just going to go up with the up arrow and then scroll back over and edit it the way that I want to. So the other common flag is the v flag for verbose, which um, will list out what it's doing. So now instead of um, as it was here, the tar command didn't actually produce any output without the v flag. With the v flag for verbose, it lists out all of the things that it's including inside of the tar file. So now it just prints out this output, which uh, makes it a little bit easier to see what's going on. So this .tar.gz file is sometimes called a tarball. 
um, colloquially in Unix uh, terminology. A tarball is a tar file that's been compressed. It's an archive of all the files and folders of whatever it was that we put inside of there. So we can remove that then. And we can talk about zip files. Zip files are not as common in Unix um, if you go to a website that's geared for Unix stuff and, for instance, download the source code to a program that's meant to be run on a Unix system, it's more likely that it's going to be distributed in the .tar.gz file format because that's more Unix-centric, I suppose. But we can deal with zip files as well, which um, might be more helpful if you want to like uh, copy it onto your own computer. Um, I'm not sure if Mac can open .tar.gz. By default, I don't think Windows can. But if you download better sort of um, zip file file programs for Windows, like uh, 7-zip, for instance, it can deal with .tar.gz files. But if you want to deal with zip files, you can do that as well um, with the program zip. Zip takes as its first argument the name of the um, thing that you want to uh, create as a zip file. So it takes the name of the file you want to create. Then like tar, it takes in as um, its next parameters the um, files and directories that you want to create. But unfortunately, um, it doesn't by default do things recursively. So by default, um, zip didn't actually put anything inside of project one into the zip file, which is pretty annoying. So let me uh, remove this zip file um, and do it again. But this time, I'm going to pass the dash r flag. So by default, tar does things recursively. Um, by default, uh, the zip program doesn't, which I think is a little bit silly because there's not really a time when you would want to put an archive in but just put the name of the archive. I'm not really sure why you'd want to do that. So now with the dash r flag, um, zip by default does give us verbose output. So it indicates that it put all of these things into the zip file. So now we have project one dash backup dot zip which is made with the zip command here. Now I should be able to remove the program.py, which I put in there, and also um, remove recursively project one so that I can get these things back out of the zip file. That's done with this unzip command. So if I just type unzip followed by the name of the zip file, it will extract them back out. And now we can see those things have been sort of recreated back for us. So that's using um, the zip command to deal with uh, creating zip files and the unzip command to deal with extracting zip files. Like I said, though, on the, if you're doing things in more of a Unix-centric way, more often than not, you'll be doing with these .tar.gz files instead. OK, our next thing to talk about is how you download files from the internet and pull them into your um, your system that you're dealing with here, in this case, the CPSC server that we're logged into. That can be done with the wget command. wget is a command that lets us download things from the internet onto our local directory, wherever we run the command at. Now, wget has uh, some pretty advanced usages, in which case you can basically download like an entire copy of a website recursively, including like all the um, pages that it links to and stuff like that. But most of the time, this is a pretty simple usage of how we're going to use wget. You can give it a URL to somewhere on the internet, inside of quotes, usually. Um, that way, if there's special um, symbols in here, they won't really uh, mess up um, the wget command. And when we run this, it simply connects to this uh, website and requests the file that is stored inside of here. So in this example, I found a link to one of the sample programs for my 110 class uh, on my own website and just pasted in the URL into the command line. By the way, to paste is different depending on what terminal you're using. On this Linux-based terminal, it's Control-Shift-V for me. If you're using PuTTY, you can right-click. Um, for a Mac terminal, I'm not really sure, but I'm sure you can find that if you go into the edit menu of it. I'm sure it'll tell you. But uh, pasting into the terminal is something that you should learn how to do. It depends not uh, on what machine you're connected into, but rather what terminal you're using, whether you're doing PuTTY on Windows, or in this case, I'm using a Linux terminal called console. 
So then once you've pasted in the URL that you want to download from, it does that. It does the connection, and it, in this case, succeeded. If it uh, doesn't succeed, then it will give you like a 404 error or something like that, just like as if you were going to connect to a web page that didn't exist. And now we can see that this file, quizzes.py, which is one of the example programs from my 110 class, has been downloaded into our directory. And then we can do stuff with it, um, run the program, or edit it, or whatever it is that we want to do. So wget, and then quotes, and then paste in somehow or another get, uh, ideally not type because URLs tend to be long, but put in the text of the file that you want to download, and then it will do it. Um, that is a pretty simple one. Something else that I should mention that I don't think I've mentioned yet is that um, Linux file names are case sensitive. This is not the case on Windows, not the case on Windows, I get it? Um, and Windows, if you make a file that's called like uppercase, um, uh, don't know, program uh, one dot Java or something like that. That will be exactly identical to lowercase program one dot Java. And so if you try to create a program with one name and then access the program with a different name or the file, um, uh, different based on the case of it. On Windows, it will work. It will give you the contents of the file because Windows considers case to be an unimportant thing. It doesn't distinguish different file names or directory names based on what case they are. Um, on Mac, I think it depends on what type of file system you're dealing with. Um, I think on some Mac are case sensitive and some they aren't, perhaps. I'm not totally sure. But on Unix systems, um, uh, this this really is actually not a, a feature of uh, the um, operating system you're dealing with. It's actually a feature of the file system, and different operating systems support a different set of file systems. So it's really a little bit more complicated than that. But in general, Unix-based file systems are case sensitive. And so as you can see here, if we try to access something as all caps program one.java and then access it um, or rather create it with all caps and then access it with all lowercase, it will tell us that this file or directory doesn't exist because it does consider these to be completely different names based on the difference of lowercase versus uppercase letters. So I just wanted to point that out, um, that uh, if you're used to not caring about the case as you access things on Windows especially, um, that doesn't work on Linux. The thing is that on um, uh, Linux, most um, file and directory names tend to be lowercase. Um, uh, all of the sort of ones in like the slash directory, for instance, these all only use lowercase letters. Um, I keep that convention as well, unless there's a very good reason not to. I will name everything with lowercase letters, whether it's a directory or a file. That just keeps things easier because you don't have to worry about whether you made something uppercase or not. Um, that makes things uh, a little bit different from Windows. On Windows, you have um, things called like uh, MySpace documents and stuff like that. That's a very unusual thing to see on Linux. You don't generally have uppercase letters in file or directory names, and you also don't generally have spaces in file names either. So if you were doing things a more um, Unix-centric way, you'd name the directory something like my-documents, so that it doesn't have a space in it, which um, will make things easier to deal with on the command line. And also, it doesn't uh, generally include lowercase letters when you're dealing with files in a Unix system. OK, our last topic for today is accessing files remotely. So to do this, um, we'll have to use a different program. Um, the terminal that we've been using, if you're on Windows, you're using PuTTY. And if you're on Linux or Mac, um, you're just using sort of your native terminal. Um, PuTTY, for instance, uh, can't access files and transfer them back and forth. Um, we actually can do that directly on the command line on a Linux or a Mac system, and we'll look at that for sure um, in a bit here. But first, we'll talk about this program called FileZilla, which can be used to access files and move them back and forth between the CPSC server and your own local laptop or desktop computer. And the nice thing about FileZilla is it works on Mac or Linux or Windows, so you can just do it the same way regardless of what system you're dealing with. Um, 
So FileZilla is a program that you have to download and install on your computer. Um, like I said, it supports Mac or Linux or Windows. And so um, there's a link to it on the page here, or you can just search for FileZilla. One thing about FileZilla is that it includes both a server program and also a client program. For this, we want to make sure we get the client program. If you get the server, then it will not work the same way and it will be really confusing. It's for a different thing. Um, so make sure you get the FileZilla client. Okay, so let's switch over to a FileZilla window. And this is what it looks like on um, when I have it installed on Linux. If you uh, install it on Windows or Mac, it'll look very similar to this, just uh, you know, the, the coloring and stuff is different. But when we, we, when we use FileZilla, you put the login information up here at the top of the um, screen, and then you can click Quick Connect. So the host for this is going to be cpsc.umw.edu. The host is the name or the IP address of the machine you want to connect to. Then the username is exactly the same as you log in on the command line. It will be um, your net ID. The password is the password that you use to log into the server. Um, so when you SSH in, you put in your password, you would use the same exact password um, here. And the port is 22. Um, that's the default port for SSH, and we're logging in over SSH um, just in a different way than we normally do. Then you can click Quick Connect, and then it should tell you um, good things here about logging in successfully. Um, if it gives you an error, then double check your password and double check that you have typed in your username and stuff correctly. Then you can see there's this text that says local site on the left and this text that says remote site on the right. Remote site is the machine you're logged into, in this case, the CPSC server. Then over here, we have our local machine. It, by default, I think, shows your home directory. So I have my home directory on my own local computer in my office. And over here, I have the um, files and directories I have on CPSC server. So you can see here's this like project one directly, directory that I had. And it has, like I said, some Java files and stuff inside of there. So if you want, you can pull up a directory on here. So I can open up like downloads or something like that. And then I can move things back and forth. So let me go up actually. Uh, where can I pull from? I don't know, uh, in the projects. And then I have some, uh, this is a program I've written. Um, so if I wanted to take the C++ file and put it into project one, you just basically drag it across from left to right. That transfers something from your local machine onto the server. And so now this file is on the CPSC server. I've put it there from my local computer. You can see here that the six, this is in the successful transfers category. If it didn't work for some reason, you can see it in the failed transfers. Likewise, if I want to take this .java file and move it over into, let's say, my downloads, I can first open up my downloads over here on the left. Then I can move interpreter.java over here, and it will show up now in my downloads file of just my local computer. So FileZilla lets you just connect on the top. Then you can sort of drag things back and forth from whatever directory to whatever directory, either from the remote machine, CPSC server, onto your own computer, or from your own computer onto the CPSC server. So that's how that works. Um, FileZilla is a really pretty easy to use program, and uh, I think hopefully that it'll work well for that purpose for you. The last thing to talk about today is how you can transfer files directly on the command line from one machine to another. This will only work between two Unix systems. So it will let you, if you have Linux as your local computer operating system, it'll let you transfer things back and forth between the CPSC server, or if you have a Mac, as your local computer system, like if you if you have an Apple laptop or a desktop, then you can use it as well to transfer back and forth from the CPSC server directly on the command line. Or if you have multiple um, machines that you're connecting with over SSH, you can transfer between them sort of in any direction. So let's um, pull open uh, the terminal window again, and I will log out of CPSC server and clear the screen. Now I'm just on my own local computer, which I've named Magrathea. Now, um, if I want to transfer things back and forth 
from uh, my own computer with the CPSC server, I can use the SCP command. So let me CD into the downloads folder. Um, now I have this interpreter.java here that I grabbed using FileZilla. If I want to, I can send this back to my home directory on, on the CPSC server. That's done using the SCP command. SCP is very much like the regular old CP. So last week, we looked at the CP command to copy files. You can copy a file from one place to another with this. SCP also lets you do that, but SCP um, stands for secure copy because it uses the secure shell protocol to copy back and forth across the network as well. So the way this works is if I want to copy something from my local computer to the remote computer, first I do the local file first, just interpreter.java. Then I reference the um, remote machine, which um, has to start with your username at the host name, .edu, like this. Um, if your username is the same between the two machines, you can actually leave the ifinlay at part off. So for me, I always make my username ifinlay for simplicity's sake. And then you can actually get rid of this and just say cpsc.umw.edu. But probably, especially if you're using a Mac, your host name on your Mac, your username is not the same as your NetID. So for you all, you would type your NetID at and then cpsc.umw.edu as I've done here. Then you put a colon. That separates the host name part, like the, referencing the machine you're putting it on, versus where you want to put it. If you just want to stick it in your home directory, you can just put tilde. And then if you hit Enter, it should do the transfer. So if you get this 100% here, then it, you know, it worked. If it didn't, if you mess something up, it will give you some sort of error message, of course. So now I've moved interpreter.java onto the CPSC server. Um, just in my home directory. So now if I SSH into uh, the CPSC server and do an ls, you can see interpreter.java is right here. I can now remove it. And I'll also remove this all uppercase program I made. And I'll remove quizzes. And I'll remove project uh, one backup. So now let's say I want to grab this program.py and put it onto my local computer. I can't really do that from here. I can't do it from the CPSC server, at least not easily, because my own local computer isn't accessible on the network. And that almost certainly will be the case for you as well. Um, and so you can't push things from the CPSC server to your local computer. And you also can't pull things from being on the CPSC server uh, from your local computer onto the CPSC server. These commands should always only happen sort of on your local computer when you're dealing with SCP. So if I'm here, if I'm on the, uh, my local computer, Magrathia is the name of my computer. Um, bonus points if you know what Magrathia is, I guess. Um, but uh, if, I, if I want to download something from the CPSC server onto just my local computer without doing FileZilla but doing it from the command line, I have to be logged in um, on the command line into my local computer. I can't be on the CPSC server. I can't be SSH'd in. I just have to be on a local terminal. Then I would do SCP. And now, just like regular CP command, first thing that comes is the name of the file that already exists that you want to pull from. And now this will be referenced uh, like it was before. Your username at the name of the machine, and then colon, and then the path to the file that you want to grab. So in this case, it would be in my home directory, and then program.py. If you want it to, you can go in deeper than that. You can say, project one slash tests slash, I think this is the name of a file I have. And then you have the place that you want to put it. Usually for this, I'll just put dot. So this means copy this file logged in with ifinlay on cpsc.umw.edu in my home directory in project one in test, the file named fact.sl. Just copy it into the home directory, which is the dot. Remember on the command line, dot is always a reference just to our um, current working directory where we're, wherever we're currently at. So now it downloads fact.sl over the command line and plops it down into our current directory of wherever we're at um, logged in as. So if you um, didn't have SSH keys set up, this would have asked you for your login password every time you do it because you're logging into the computer to grab that file. 
Um, if you have your SSH keys set up, as I do, it doesn't ask for your password. It just logs in using your keys instead. So that's two ways that we can access files remotely from one um, machine back to our uh, local machine. You can do it the graphical way using FileZilla, which is probably really the easiest. Um, but if you want to do it on the command line directly and your local computer is also a Unix system, then you can do it using SCP as well. So we've covered a lot of things today. We've covered how to use wildcards to reference multiple files all at once. We've talked about creating and dealing with archives, either in the .zip format or the .tar or .tar.gz formats. We've talked about how to download files using wget. We've talked about symbolic links. And now lastly, we've talked about the very important skill of being able to move files back and forth between your own computer and the CPSC server. Next week, we're going to talk about the Vim program that we use to actually edit files on the command line, which is going to be a big week because we can start doing more interesting things. Now we won't just be working with dummy files that are actually empty. Now we'll be able to actually put text into files so that we can write programs and write shell scripts and do other sort of fun stuff like that. So that's what we'll talk about next week. I hope you all have a good week, and I'll see you next time. Bye.